All right, everybody. So before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to Slim Pickens Outfitters. Uh, they were gracious enough to sponsor one of our previous book discussions, and they have given our book club a, um, a discount code to use uh, to purchase some of their clothing items. It is the first Black-owned gear store in the country. So when we think about outdoor gear, I'm thinking about like when you go hunting, when you're an outdoorsman or an outdoors woman, and they have uh, what I would say more closely relevant gear uh, for people who are Black, people who uh, represent our community. And there you can see the uh, discount code at slimpickensoutfitters.com, uh, EA Book Club. And uh, we were also sponsored by Cirrus Outfitters, which is a Black-owned gear shop that emphasizes skiing. And so just to talk a little bit about what Entrepreneurial Appetite is, uh, it is a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism, and supporting Black businesses. And today I have the honor of introducing you all to uh, Reverend DeForest Buster Soares. Uh, and we'll get started here in one moment. So uh, just to give you all some context for this, uh, Pastor Soares was the pastor of the church that I grew up in in New Jersey. And uh, one of the things that I love about growing up in First Baptist Church of Lincoln Gardens in Somerset, New Jersey, is that uh, it was a church that was deeply rooted in the community that it was in. And uh, one of my fondest memories, maybe not so fond, is that Pastor Soares would always invite the students to bring their report cards up. He did not care about the FERPA laws. He wanted to make sure everybody was getting good grades. And at the time, I wasn't the best student. But Nevertheless, I still got a scholarship from First Baptist Church to go to college. And I had the opportunity to go to North Carolina A&T in part because of their support, but that's, that's the place where I became uh, much more into intellectualism and a better student. And so First Baptist Church of Lincoln Gardens is, is a big part of my journey academically and professionally because now I'm a college professor. And the culture that I was exposed to at the church is a huge part of making me who I am today. And so before we begin, I'm gonna let Dr. Soares, past Reverend Dr. Soares introduce himself and uh, make you all familiar with the uh, D-Free movement. Thank you for those introductory remarks. It's quite humbling to see you all grown up. You know, we had our youth ministry, we called the jam. I'm not sure we could call it jam today because the culture has changed, but back yeah. in those days, you know, to go to a jam was either like a jazz jam session or a Saturday night party. So we just took the concept from the culture and we turned the jam into Jesus and me. Uh, and you were one of the uh, active young people in Jesus and me. Brother Michael Penix was our leader and so many young people came out of that ministry. But the whole point was then as it is now making church in general and and Jesus in particular relevant. You know, every generation has the obligation of making the culture address the contemporary needs of the community. And every church has an obligation to the community to be a resource for the community. And if you recall, a good portion of the young people who came to JAM weren't members of our church. Yeah. And we didn't distinguish between church members and non-church members. We were just jamming for Jesus together. Um, I started jam back in the 1970s and uh, it, I brought it with me to First Baptist and the people responded. But before I, long before I got to First Baptist, the church had a tremendous commitment to young people hmm. through traditional and non-traditional programs and activities. And I just, I just tried to build on the foundation that I inherited when I got there. And you caught me just in time because I'm 13 days away from retirement. Congratulations. On, on Thank you so much. June 30th, I will retire after having been senior pastor for 30.6 years. And uh, it's been a great run and it's time for me to step aside and let a younger man come in and take the church to another level. But uh, I've always had a commitment to spiritual growth, academic excellence, and economic empowerment. We give scholarships this Sunday 
uh, coming. It's Father's Day. We're awarding high school seniors with scholarships who are members of the church. And uh, I'm just so happy that you were able to experience a positive connection to the church and carry that with you now into your career. Definitely. So um, I, I want to talk, because you, you highlighted a little bit um, the scholarship fund. And we're going to get a little bit more in depth about uh, Say Yes to No Debt and the D-Free movement. Just generally speaking, because I, I guess from my generation, I'm, I'm an older millennial, there have been some critiques about um, the Black church not being relevant to social justice issues or even economic issues that face Black communities. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective, what role does the church have in supporting and sustaining the economic liberation of Black communities? Sure. I think the church is central to the possibilities of Black people, and the church has an obligation to address holistic needs that Black people have. You know, one of my academic mentors at Princeton, where I did my master's degree, was Dr. Peter Paris. And Peter Paris wrote an important book called The Social Teaching of the Black Churches. Mm. And without even reading the book, and it's a, it's a profound book, it talks about how Black churches have interpreted scripture to aim at justice issues and economic issues. But if you just look at the name of the book, The Social Teaching of the Black Churches, yes. it, it, what it does, it informs us that there is not one black church. Mm. And so when you talk about a critique of the black church, you have to distinguish between the various types of black churches. There's some black churches that are so fundamentalist, all they care about is helping people get to heaven. Mm. There's some black churches that are led by men who have convinced people that if the people make the preacher rich, then God will make the, pre the people rich. You know, they're better known as prosperity gospel. And then there are churches that are in the mainstream tradition of the African-American church where the black churches were started in response to injustice. There wouldn't be a black church had there not been racism. There wouldn't be a black church had the white Christian churches not treated black Christians like second-class citizens. And so the black church was born in protest. It was born in response to racial injustice which means that if we're gonna be true to our tradition, true to our founding, true to the God who used the black church as a kind of arc in response to the tidal wave of oppression, then today we would pick up the mantle uh, of the historic African-American religious tradition, speak truth to power. And remember Jesus said that he was anointed to preach good news to the poor and set captives free. And so D3 specifically as a ministry that grew out of First Baptist Church is a ministry that's designed to speak truth to power and good news to the poor. The good news is that poverty is not a curse. Poverty is an economic condition that can be addressed strategically. And so we deal with both systemic and individual causes of poverty and we help people overcome both. That's good. I, one of the things that you talked about dealing with people in poverty, uh, I remember watching you on CNN's in the Black Church a few years ago, and there's a difference between being poor and not being wealthy, right? Because we right. have lots of middle class Black folk who still don't have the wealth uh, that our white counterparts do. And maybe we shouldn't even make those comparisons. I don't know. But the reality is, is that there are middle-class Black folks struggling with their finances. So can you talk a little bit about how we have more of these conversations like across sort of the economic diversity of Black communities? Yeah, um, I distinguish between middle-class and middle-income in the first instance, because a lot of, uh, at least a third of Black America is middle-income. But if you don't have assets that exceed your liabilities, if you've not inherited assets from previous generations, if you don't have uh, home ownership or equity in your home, if you don't have savings that you're able to um, keep to the side and use for emergencies, then you're not gonna create wealth. And so the black experience is such that, listen, we, we celebrate on Saturday, Juneteenth, 
1865 was not that long ago, but for 200 and some years prior to 1865, black people worked for free. So if, if my family has been working and getting paid for 250 years, if your family has been working for my family and I'm not paying you, I'm getting paid double and you're getting paid nothing. So 150 years after slavery, we find these economic disparities that are rooted in the, the, the history of our real experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and today, uh, it's exacerbated by the disparity in incomes. I mean, all the data suggests that the odds are against black people. However, the anecdotal data says that while the odds are against black people creating wealth, there are some black wealthy people. Yeah. So what we wanna do is understand the history, but also understand the methodology of those who have defied the history because that in that defiance, we can get a roadmap for discovering possibilities for wealth ourselves. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about the D-Free origin story and how you were able to get that in place at First Baptist Church and then get it to spread in some other Black institutions, maybe even outside of the church. Well, sure. I, I was trained by Jesse Jackson to be a civil rights activist. That, that's my roots. Dr. King was killed April 4th, 1968. I was a junior in high school. I decided that day that I was gonna dedicate the rest of my life to helping black people. And at that point, I thought I'd be a lawyer and help black people by defending them in court. Mm. But as God would have it, I took a different path. And I decided that Jesse Jackson was the best follow-up to the work Dr. King had been doing in the 1960s. Now, in the early 1970s, what Jesse Jackson's message was this. The civil rights movement is over and it's over because it won. We, we won all of the victories that the civil rights movement was crafted to address. And what Reverend Jackson was saying in the early 1970s was, therefore, the next movement has to be economic. Hmm. We have to learn to leverage our financial power and only support those companies that support us. We have to pool our resources and form our businesses. His whole his message was so honed and so focused on, on money, Langston, that here was his line. We, we, we have to go from civil rights to silver rights. And as a young guy coming out of college, I was attracted to that. I said, exactly, that's me. So I went to work for Reverend Jackson. And what, what happened after two or three years was I felt myself being sucked more into protest than development. And I felt that we were trying to keep the civil rights movement alive and just use different language. And I, and I, needed, I, needed, and, and I needed two things. First of all, I needed to stop living a lie mm. because while I was doing all that activism, I think your generation would say I was woke. I mean, I was woke, but I was broke. Right. I didn't save money. I wore nice clothes. I drove fancy cars. And so by day, I'm a hero. I mean, I'm a young guy in the community speaking truth to power let my people go. And then I'd come home from protest to get calls from bill collectors. <laughs> you know, I was living above my means. I was using credit cards to look good on the outside. And, you know, my dad died when I was 24, he was 47 and my mother was 44. And when my dad died, I was, I was pretty famous for a young guy, but I was broke. I wouldn't, I, I could not have bought my mother a hamburger to help her survive after my dad died had he not had insurance, I don't know where she'd be. And so from the time I was 19 to the time I was 31, I was really fronting. I was pastoring a church, Langston, where yeah. I was teaching people to tithe 10% of their income. And I couldn't do it myself because I was too busy spending money on things that made me look like a preacher instead of me saving like I had some good sense. And so, uh, when I was 31, my grandmother died. My father's mother died. When she died, sixth grade education, six children with a, with a husband who was an invalid who couldn't work to support her. Mm. She sold clothes for a living, but she died with three houses paid for. And one of those houses she left to me. And so the first house I owned was inherited by my grandmother. 
And I, and I looked at my life and I said, look, my grandmother had no education, no civil rights, no husband to support her, yet she died a, a wealthy woman. And here I am with college degrees, newspaper clippings, I, you know, I've been all over the country preaching and I am broke. And I decided that day I had to change my life. I had to continue fighting against injustice, but I had to stop spending money on things that look good, but have no value. I had to get rid of my nice bachelor's apartment. I had to sell my luxury car. I had to sell all that furniture, get rid of these credit cards and start living within my means and paying my bills on time, stop fighting with bill collectors and paying high, high interest rates and late fees. And I had to start living within a budget. Now, it doesn't sound revolutionary. Yeah. It doesn't sound sexy. But one of the realities about Black America is that so many of us are living the way I used to live that we wouldn't have, we listen, we wouldn't have an HBCU. We wouldn't have a civil rights organization. We wouldn't have any of the Black institutions that we say we care about yeah. if it weren't for white people. Black Lives Matter would have to shut down if they depended on black dollars. Yeah. It's white money keeping black lives matter functioning. Now, I'm not against white money, yeah. but I think it's hypocritical for me, for me mm -hmm. as a black pastor, I was a black activist. I, I could not donate a quarter to NAACP, United Negro College Fund. When you talk about the scholarship we gave you at First Baptist, yeah. that's all black money. That's right. It's black people deciding that, that they're gonna take money that they could spend on themselves and put it in a scholarship fund so we can help young guys like you. And that's something the government can't do. The government can't do for us. That's something we have to do for ourselves. Absolutely. So when D free came along, mm. it came along when I discovered that I had to basically give away my strategy. 2005, we we're in New Jersey at the church that you described. And many of our members were making a lot of money, but they were driving luxury cars. They had high credit card expenses. They bought houses bigger than they could afford. And we decided that it was in the best interest of the church to focus on the member's financial status and make it more important than the need that the church had for money. And so we just went after it. And what I did was I took my experience after my grandmother died, and I turned it into a program and said, look, when I was living like you people are living, here's what I did. I wrote it down. I wrote a book. CNN came along, put us on full blast. And now 16 years later, we have paid down over $31 million in consumer debt. We've trained over 5,000 people, 5,000 churches to use our curriculum and our strategy. We have uh, over 250 chapters of Delta Sigma Theta sorority using our curriculum for their members and communities. And, and, and listen, we're just getting started. We're getting ready to launch a podcast network with uh, various personalities doing podcasts that focus on, that uh, one of them focuses on women, understanding mm -hmm. the finances so that when their husbands die or leave, they're not stuck in poverty. We've got one that's gonna be focused on sports and money. We've got another one that's gonna focus on successful black businesses the way you do. And we're just putting together the D Free Podcast Network. We'll launch that in July. So we have a lot coming, but at the core, here's the core. There, there are good, we call them good deeds and bad deeds. Mm. The good deeds are the D of depositing money in your own account, right? Yeah. And let me stay there for a while. A good D is having your name on a D because you own some real estate. And a good D is earning dividends from investments, making your money work for you instead of you working for money. The bad Ds are debt, delinquency, and deficit. The bad D is paying 16% interest on a credit card, paying $35 late fees because you're, you're, you're always delinquent and living above your means. And if we can get rid of the bad Ds, then we can enjoy the good deeds. I, um, I, I have these debates with my friends all the time. Uh, people who in my circle, they know me as the cheap one. Um, I was the last person to get a smartphone. You know, everybody's telling me to get a new car. I lived in an apartment with no furniture for like two or three years so I could pay my student loans off. Yes, sir. I had a roommate when I was like 
in my early 30s as a college professor, because in my mind, I was going to save up and buy a house with no debt. So I hear all of these, all of these, you know, voices there. Some people are like, yo, you'll always be in debt. There's no way you can never be in debt. There's other people who are like, it's suboptimal for you to not just go get the loan and get your house now with the way the interest rates are. And it, it didn't work out that I, I, I got a house debt free, but I'm, I'm wondering, like, I, I, I just pose the question like this. Would Black people as a whole be better off if we committed just hardcore no debt period or just in some instances decided that here's an instance where I would get some good debt? You know what I mean? So how, how do you feel about, like, the hardcore no, no debtors and some people who are like, this debt could actually lead to a greater outcome? I don't believe in no debt at all. I'm against debt that is created to support a lifestyle that you cannot afford. Mm. That's what I'm against. I, and that's the kind of debt I had. I made $25,000 a year, but I had a credit card with a $5,000 spending limit. So I lived as if I earned $30,000 a year. So that, that's, that's bad debt. Yeah. But I recently sold an apartment building. I owed two and a half million dollars to a bank on a building that was worth $4 million. Every month, my tenants paid me rent and I took the rent money to pay off the mortgage. When I bought the building, it was worth $3.7 million. So where did the 1.2 million in equity come from? The tenants. So yeah. when you have other people paying off your debt, that's good debt. Yeah. So I sold the apartment building, now the money's in my bank account. So debt to be used strategically to create wealth, that's good debt. Okay. Bad debt is debt used to support a lifestyle, to buy a BMW when you can really only afford a Toyota. Debt to buy shoes with red bottoms when brown bottoms are probably even more comfortable. You know, Debt to change the color of your hair every three weeks when you're not impressing anybody with blonde hair, red hair, and then braids. So, so Langston, I'm not against all, that would be, that would be Dave Ramsey. He's against yeah. all debt all the time. Of course, now that he's a multimillionaire, he's, he's yeah. against all debt. Debt should be used strategically to create wealth. Debt, to, debt used to support a lifestyle that makes me look good, even though I owe more money than I own, that's bad debt. So, so, I'll put it to you this way. Suppose okay. I told you mm -hmm. that I could guarantee you, you give me $10,000 and I could guarantee you a 16% return on your money. That's a great return. That's great. That I could, that, that every year you'd make 16, your $10,000 would make $1,600 just by sitting there. Well, I can guarantee you a 16% return by paying off a credit card that has 16% interest. Right. You know, I, I'm involved in two public companies and people ask me about buying stock because both of my companies, the stock is doing pretty well. And I've made a decent amount of money in the stock market. But the best investment, the best investment is to pay off interest rate on credit cards and on cars. I mean, one of my young friends told me today that they have a car loan and they're paying 16.9% interest. And I'm telling you, it doesn't make sense to buy stock. A good stock, a, I mean a great stock, yeah. will give you eight to twelve percent return. That's still not sixteen to twenty-four percent that you pay on on credit cards. And so it's a matter of it's 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 changing our minds. You know, you were the last person to get a cell phone, a smartphone. I was the last person to get a flat screen TV. A church member, one of our church members, stopped by the house one day. And they walked in our TV room and they were offended. And they were like, you don't have a flat screen TV? Mm. I said, no, my, this TV works just fine. And they said, well, I can't, I can't believe it. So I said, well, listen, if you want me to have a flat screen TV that badly, you, you go get me a flat screen TV. Yeah. You know, they went out and bought a flat screen TV. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, listen, I didn't buy it. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, we have to change the way we think uh, I was reading about a celebrity. I can't think of which one it was, but that celebrity said that they don't fly private planes. Well, Missy Elliott was the first person to say mm. it. they don't fly private planes. And 
I don't even think they fly first class because celebrities, some celebrities know that you can be real famous today and in three years, people yeah. ask you, well, didn't you used to be so-and-so? Yeah. So, so we have to change the way we think. We have to stop thinking that being dressed up on the outside and looking wealthy is equal to being wealthy. Right. I, I think the point that you made about the 16.9% return on an investment is important. Uh, I think in, 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 in the younger culture now, everyone's big on getting into the stock market, starting a business, earn your leisure is like blowing up. On the one hand, it's, it's almost, I feel like it's bigger than a breakfast club, like culturally. It's, it's, it's as big as the breakfast club. But then on the money side of conversations, things, it's getting to be as big as Dave Ramsey's. And I think they give great strategies and great insights into building wealth. But what you just said, I think to me, is the first time anyone has framed getting out of debt on something that is a high interest rate is actually a better investment than going into the stock market. And sometimes we need to sit back and just do the math. Right, because some because you could be hustling backwards making all of these investments if you have all of these debts. And since we're you brought up Dave Ramsey's and whatnot, I, and before we get into the twelve step process, can you can you talk a little bit about like the importance of these conversations being culturally relevant to Black people so that we can we can maximize their usage? Yeah, one one of the things that I'm very proud of is that our curriculum, our content. Um, is culturally relevant. And, and here's what I mean by culturally relevant. We, we, we borrow heavily from the narrative of our history. I'll give you a good example. At Shaw University, there is a chapel on campus, beautiful building. It's where freshman orientation takes place. It's where religious emphasis week takes place. Uh, there's a lecture series and it's called the Thomas Boyd Chapel. Thomas Boyd was the pastor of Salem Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York for years. And when he was 93 years old, he came to hear me speak in the chapel that bears his name. Now, mind you, I had spoken there 12 years in a row mm -hmm. and I always thought that the person whose name was on the chapel was dead. I didn't know Thomas Boyd was still alive until that day he came to hear me speak. We went out to lunch. And I said to him, I said, Dr. Boyd, let me ask you a question. Um, how, how did you manage to get them to name a building after you at Shaw University while you're still alive? Because you know, buildings are normally named after people when they die. He said, well, it may have something to do with the fact that I gave them $500,000 to build the building. So I said to him, well, wait a minute, you know, you were a Baptist preacher. I, I didn't read anything else about you other than you being the pastor of Salem Baptist Church. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church. I don't make that kind of money that would put me in a position to write a check for $500,000. How'd you do it? He said, listen, when I first started as a minister, every time I do a wedding, every time I do a funeral, every time I'd be a guest speaker somewhere, I would get paid and I wouldn't spend the money. And he went on to explain. I put the money in a separate account and the account got so big the bank called me and said, Reverend, you know, you've got too much money in this account. Mm. We, you need to let us help you invest the money. And he said, and it just grew and grew and grew year after year. And he said, finally, I came back to Shaw University from which I graduated. I saw that the chapel had been destroyed in a storm and my heart was broken. I took out my checkbook and I just wrote a check for $500,000. Now, this is a lesson in our curriculum. Yeah. And what I'm saying to black people, black preachers, black Christians, here is an example of what you can do if you're willing to make some extra money and not spend it. I was at a point in my life where every time I, I gave a speech or did a wedding or funeral, they gave me some money, I'd spend it. In fact, sometimes I'd ask to be paid in cash because I wanted to spend it that day. Right. And, and, and that day, having lunch with Dr. Boyd changed my life and I started doing the same thing. I, every time I give a speech, every time I do anything that gives me extra cash above my salary, I don't spend it. I put it somewhere. And now I'm in the same kind of position that Dr. Boyd was in. And that's in my curriculum, you see? Yeah. And when you have a history like ours that is saturated with bad news, I mean, we just 
we just marked the 100th anniversary of the racial massacre yeah. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'll celebrate Juneteenth on Saturday. The fact is, Black people have had to endure some of the tough, toughest experiences any human in any country at any time in history. Yeah. But the fact is, here we are. That's right. We, we have been resilient. We, we, we've started churches. We've started colleges. And so our curriculum draws on the strengths and the successes and the resilience of Black people. And I believe your generation, if you really, really are taught how profound Black people have been, then you'll pick up the mantle, use the examples, and you'll say to yourself, listen, of course racism is alive today, but it can't be as bad as it was 100 years ago. And if they could do what they did 100 years ago, what is our problem today? That's right. So cultural relevance is absolutely critical. And that's what D3 is. D3 is, is biblically based. I'm a preacher. It's culturally relevant and it's affordable. My book only costs $10, $10. My workbook costs $10 and our online academy is free, free. Yeah. Doesn't cost anything. You can sign up right now. You can register for the course. You can start taking the course. I walk you through my book online for free. I tell some stories. I give you some suggestions and their worksheets and it's all free. We have raised money to build a platform that we can give to black America for free. And I, I think that's amazing because when I, I read the book and I went through the program, when I heard the story of Pastor Boyd, it made me think of the fact that I was reading the book, going through the workbook in a black church, learning about a black preacher who's, a, these are all black institutions who used his platform in a black institution to support another black institution. And I right. think part of the, part of where I hope we go as a group of people is to think about our finances, not just about as enriching us and getting ourselves out of debt, but also thinking about the value of philanthropy. And I don't, I don't mean charity, I mean, philanthropy yeah, because institutions yeah. change policy. They, they change curriculum in K through 12 schools. That's what really empowers groups of people. So I thought that that was a powerful narrative, but then also in a lot of ways planted seeds for something bigger than just our own personal economic liberation. Langston, you know, um, I don't talk about this a lot, but one of my other motivations for launching D3 was that I just got tired of watching preachers on television talk about money as if the, the ultimate goal is to spend it on yourself. Mm. You know, these are some of these people I, I grew up with. I, I knew these guys. And um, to think that, that God wants you rich so that you could drive a Rolls Royce and look rich, that, that's blasphemy. And so if, if you notice in, in the process and what we call our curriculum, there are four levels. Level one responds to the question, I get more than any other question. How do I get started? You know, I, I've got debt, I've got student loan debt, my mother's sick, I've got hospital bills. You know, how do I get started? For the person who is stuck, and, and, at, and to your previous point, you may not be stuck in poverty, you could be stuck just living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Living paycheck to paycheck is stressful. It is. Especially when you know that if you miss two paychecks, You've got no savings, you've got no assets, you've got no strategy. If your company goes out of business or if you get laid off for some other reason, living paycheck to paycheck is stressful. So if you're stuck, the first question you wanna know is how, do, how can I get started to get to the next level? How can I, how can I get started? So that's where we start. And, and, and most of the answer to that question is mentality, mm. you know? It's admit the problem, whatever problem, you know, whatever, you know, my problem, even after I started making money was chaos. I was disorganized. Mm. And sometimes just chaos is a problem. Sometimes a lack of focus is the problem. But the first, the first level is get, get started. And you start by looking at yourself and asking yourself the tough questions, not, you know, how bad was slavery 
or how crazy is the president? No, Let, let's start with when was the last time you balanced your checkbook? Do you really need to spend $5 a day at Starbucks, $25 a week? Do you really, do, do you really need to, to pay someone to wash your car for a fee when the water at your house is just as wet as the water at the car wash? Right. These are basic things. So then the next level is get control. A young actress called me from Hollywood and said, uh, sorry, listen, I need, I need to help with my credit cards. Who do I call, what do I do? And I said, well, how much, how much credit card debt do you have? And, and she said, I, did, I don't know, just, just lost control. Wow. And so by getting control, when we get control, that's when we start looking at what we have. You know, my, my motto, Langston, is the only thing worse than not having what you need is not using what you have. Many of us have assets. Many of us have opportunities that we don't take advantage of. So that's the second level. And the third level is once you get started and take control, the third level is get ahead. How do you get ahead? How do you do some investing? Mm. What kind of insurances do I need to protect the assets that I have? You know, what kind of business could I start? What kind of side hustle can I create to increase my income? But the fourth level is the level that you're describing. The fourth level is give back. That, that financial freedom that does not include giving back, teaching others what you've learned, becoming philanthropic to causes that are important, that's not freedom at all. And, and you know, in the curriculum, that's how I describe Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman decided that the gift and blessing of her freedom from slavery required that she go back into slavery to bring people out. And so, you know, God blessed me to live long enough to outgrow my lifestyle where I was wasting money instead of saving money and I couldn't give anybody anything. Now, any cause that I care about, I can write a decent sized check and make a difference. And so my assets have been accrued and developed to position me to serve and to say, you know, I am the pastor of the church, but I'm one of the top givers at our church. Mm -hmm. Because I believe in, I believe in giving back. So financial freedom is epitomized by giving back. If we're not giving back, then we're still slaves. We're not slaves to debt, but we're slaves to possessions. And we worship our possessions so much, we can't part with them to give back. Yeah. So I want to, and I, we, we may have already sort of like hit on it, but um, I, I listened to the, to the DeFree podcast. Oh, can you talk just a, a little bit more about just impacting the culture broadly? Like how do we make DeFree uh, a broad mentality among Black communities? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, it's people like you that are going to impact the culture more than people like me. Um, people have a tendency to listen to people in their, in their circles, in their age group, in their generation. And so one of my goals is to stay as connected as I can to young people um, my staff is young, you know, um, I'm doing special events with people like Kiara Sheard, uh, gospel artists and, and other entertainers. We're, we're talking to a number of entertainers. Our board of directors at our foundation consists of mostly young people. Uh, and then we have to use media. You know, the, the EYL crowd uses media very effectively. Yeah. But I think, I think the most important and most impactful strategy that we can use is personal testimonies. Mm -hmm. We had a young 24 year old in our church give her testimony that two years after graduation, she had paid off all of her student loans. And when a 24 year old says that, a 26 year old says, well, Lord, how'd she do that? Yeah. <laughs> and I think the best way to impact the culture is by people your age and your generation going through the program, taking advantage of the resources, and then telling their story. And so we're building a studio right now, uh, right there. You know where the old post office was on Franklin Boulevard mm -hmm. in Somerset? Yeah. That, that's now our building. Are you sure you're retiring? <laughs> in fact, 
Well, yeah, I'm retiring from the church. I'm not okay, retiring. Okay, all right. right. So this, this, right, you see right, all of this behind me? That's the yeah. old post office. Mm. And these are our offices where, where the deep free work happens, where the ideas come from. And in the back, we are building a studio. And in that studio, we're going to create multimedia. We're going to create videos. We're going to create curricula. We're going to create music, uh, hip hop, gospel, all designed to create influencers and influential tools to right. reach your generation. Right. That's amazing. And so I bring up the retirement because it's like you've done it first Baptist, but it's like there's all of these other things that you are interested in doing. And I don't, I don't necessarily look at people who are older as if they aren't relevant to the culture. Because like, to me, you're an example of like what I want to be when I'm your age, right? Because like, you're what I'm, I'm, I'm aspiring to be in terms of when I'm done working in a university setting, like I, I want to be able to do my own thing to impact the culture and maintaining good financial status and having good investments allows you to be in a position that when you retire, you can still have some good work to do. And, um, and, I, and, and I appreciate that. Um, well, you know, a lot of preachers don't retire because they can't afford to. Mm. So they hold on to the church. They get too old to function. The church dies. All the young people leave. <laughs> and by the time the preacher dies, the church is dead. Our church is stronger today than it's ever been. Yeah. Spiritually, functionally, programmatically, financially. Our church is stronger today than it's ever been. And that's why I'm leaving. Because I want to leave while things are going well. But there's a big world out there. Listen, Langston, very few people know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll break it on your show. Uh, I, I have about 50 hours of footage on two African kings today, one in Ghana and one in Uganda. And that footage is the beginning of a documentary series called African Royalty Today. You know, um, we often talk colloquially about, uh, we used to be kings and queens in Africa. Yeah. We are kings and queens in Africa today. That's right. We, they are royal families. So when the, you know, the media says the royal family, you know they're talking about the royal family in England but there are royal families throughout Africa, many of whom are doing some very important developmental work for young people around healthcare and education. And what I wanna do is a documentary series that puts the spotlight on African royalty. And that's, that's my pet project. When I leave First Baptist on June 30th, on July 1st, I'll be sending packages out to Netflix, Smithsonian, Hulu, and other platforms to get a partner that can uh, put these royal families on full blast. I want the world to see black royalty and black excellence. Absolutely. That's amazing. And I never thought about that that way either, right? We always think about the kings and queens as past tense and never what's going on right now. Um, we're talking well, about different- Like, so what do you teach? What do I teach? So uh, I teach a lot of things. So. I, the, the primary class that I teach is called um, Adapted Physical Activity, which is basically how to teach and work with individuals with disabilities and physical activity. So it could be sport, it could be working out, whatever. Um, and then the other class that I teach most recently was called African Americans in Sport. And we actually made it a pod class. So we got a whole bunch of guest speakers come in and talk. And me and my homeboy, Brandon Crooms, who was teaching at the University of Texas at Austin, and another homeboy, Alvin Logan, who was teaching at uh, Seattle University, just kind of collaborated to get these speakers to come. Some people from the NFL, some former student athletes, some people working at ESPN, um, some counselors, some psychologists, all different ranges of expertise came and recorded videos. And we'll actually be launching that sometime in September for those of you who are joining us today. Sure. So uh that's that's pretty much what i do at the university but I'm, I'm also really involved in the community here uh in san antonio with some other things as well so excellent excellent i'm proud of you thank you thank you um and i used to be i used to be an elementary school physical education teacher and so we've talked about like 
all different age ranges, older people, people in the middle of their careers, people coming out of college. But how do we get the how do we get the D free message out to our young youngest, the youngest people in our community? Yeah, I had a, an intern last summer from Howard University who put together for us a strategy for a D free video game. Mm. We want to create a video game where young people are playing the game, but not realizing that while they're playing, they're being taught about finance. Wow. Um, we have we have the first generation of content we call the D free young money mm. for older youth. And we have six segments. We have a video with conversation and then worksheets and discussion guides. Uh, we're going to update that and expand it, but we want young people to help us create the content for the young people. No need an old man like me trying to create content for a nine year old. Yeah. Uh, we're also looking at partnerships. Mm. Believe it or not, there are some significant efforts being made, uh, most of them small, to teach young black people about money. Uh, you've got authors writing anima uh, animated uh, series. You, you've got uh, games, board games. Yeah. And so uh, one of my objectives is also to partner with other people. If I find someone doing good work, we can form some kind of strategic partnership because we don't have to create everything ourselves. Yeah. And we can use our platform, our resources and our network to promote uh, content that teaches the same principles, but does it in a slightly different way. Yeah, there's a, um, a, a mentor of mine that lives here in San Antonio. His name is uh, Dorian Williams and he's a pastor. And to, he's almost like a younger version of you. When I see him, I, I think about you because he's the pastor of a church he just bought a, a co-working space called the Moad Centers, and it's it's full, and it's got tons of diverse entrepreneurs working in that co-working space. But then he's also established this program called the Greenwood Program, and it's a nonprofit that helps uh, Black folk figure out how to start their businesses. You know, yeah. because I, I look at I look at D Free almost like a spectrum, and I've and I've heard you say this on a podcast before, right? So you got to pay your debts off first, the 16% interest rate on a credit card versus the 8% you might get in the stock market. So that's step one, the debt, then the investments, then maybe the entrepreneurship and then the philanthropy. And I think he's, he's more at the end of the spectrum with the, with the philanthropy and the business part. But I think that's the whole beauty of the D free movement. And that's what I think makes it a bit more culturally relevant to us as opposed to Dave Ramsey's who stops it just getting out of debt because oh, yeah. we, we need to build institutions and we need to build businesses that serve our communities and, um, and serve them well. So well, I, you know what we've done, uh, we, we have, we have our core curriculum, which you, which you, um, you have right behind you say yes to no mm -hmm. debt. Uh, and it's a book and a workbook, but then what we've done Langston because of the experiences we've had, we've created what we call supplements to the core curriculum. We have a supplement for young adults. In other words, if you're a young adult, here's how these principles probably apply to your situation. We have one for senior citizens. You know, if you're, if you're 75, D3 means something slightly different than if you're 25. That's right. So we have a, a supplement for seniors. We have a supplement for entrepreneurs. And we piloted that in, in oh God, I forget, in, uh, not Modesto, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the cities in California, I'm tired, I've been up all day. Um, the, the Black Chamber of Commerce, organization of 300 Black business people, Fresno, in mm. Fresno, California, used our D3 curriculum and the supplement to uh, fulfill a grant actually to do technical assistance for black businesses. Because you're right, J just being, being debt free, that's just the beginning. That, we, right. we, we described that as kind of getting up to zero. Ultimately, black America is not going to do well until it embraces the model in America and that is create small businesses. The majority of the jobs in this country are created by small businesses and black Americans I think have had some apprehension about 
starting our own businesses for all kinds of reasons. I mean, and all of them are, are valid, but we've got to crack the code on teaching our people that entrepreneurship is really the ticket for massive economic uplift. And we used to know that. Listen, that's what Greenwood was about. Right. You know, when you look at uh, Tulsa and look at the massacre, what, what few people realize is that the, the Black Business Initiative in Tulsa didn't start till about 1908. Mm -hmm. You know, Black people migrated to Oklahoma in the early 1900s, the way white people did, because when, when, when the, the government just ran the Indians off their land, they, they literally had a land giveaway in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so Oklahoma was a place where white people, black people, they rushed and it was, it was like a, it was almost like a race. They, 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 they fired the gun and you just went, you could literally go find yourself some land and it was yours. And so yeah. that's why we have all these little black towns, Langston, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. we had Greenwood section of Tulsa. And, but to think that the, the, the massacre happened in 1921. That's right. The community just started forming around 1908. That means in 13 years, wow. black people owned a thousand houses, 300 businesses, they owned a theater, they owned a hotel. Six black men owned their own private planes in 13 short years in, in just a couple of decades after slavery. So when you look at that, you say to yourself, my God, if blacks in the early 1900s can develop that much wealth that it drove white folks insane, imagine what we could be doing today. That's right. And think about that. And I like what you said about your grandmother is that she had no civil rights. Like these black folk in 1921, 1908 in Tulsa had no civil rights. Right. And they still built what they built. Yeah, I think in the post-civil rights era, um, I think in many ways we've been lulled to sleep. Mm. You know, it, it's almost as if we were stronger when the opposition was more explicit. Now we know that racism is alive now, but they're not lynching us downtown. They are shooting us from time to time with badges, yeah. which is a different kind of racism. But racism, you, you have you you cannot say that racism is as blatant today as it was then. Um, it's not as intimidating. You know, when I, listen, I grew up in Jersey. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a town called Montclair, but I grew up in the black section of Montclair yeah. and there were certain sections in our town. We knew we didn't go to. Yeah. We didn't go to certain parks. We didn't go to certain businesses and the town right below us, Glen Ridge, every black child that was raised in Montclair knew don't get caught in Glen Ridge after dark. Mm. This was just our reality. Yeah. So if, if we could, if we could become who we are in spite of that, then today the only barrier we really have ultimately is us. We're certainly going to, we're going to find some white people, that's, some Karens that's going to call us out of our name, period. Yeah. We're going to find some white institutions that really aren't excited about diversity and hiring us there. But there are so many opportunities that do exist that we need not hang our heads down and give up because we get one insult or one closed door. There are too many, look at Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey faced racism, but it didn't stop her from kicking Phil Donahue off the air yeah. and becoming the first black female billionaire in the country. So that, that's my message. And, and I think D3 in, incorporates all of my philosophy. I believe in fighting injustice I believe in standing up to racism. I believe in fighting for better policies, but there's some things we just have to do for ourselves. Yeah, for sure. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna allow some people from the audience to ask questions. All and right. there's two ways you all can do that. One, you can type them in the chat or you can use the Q and A function, but then also you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, what I'll do is I'll click on your name and I'll unmute you and you can ask your question verbally. Of course, if there's anything inappropriate, I'll immediately cut you off. So just as a disclaimer, we wanna keep it um, you know, relevant to the conversation that we're having right now. And so I'm gonna ask a, a question of Pastor Soares 
And if you all have questions, you can type it in the chat, like I said, or you can raise your hand and I'll come to you after he gets done with my next question. So uh, pastor stories. So I've talked about like the spectrum of going from getting out of debt to building wealth to philanthropy. We've talked a little bit about building our own businesses, uh, but I also noticed that you have a masterclass for becoming a corporate board uh, member. So could you talk a little bit about uh, how that fits into maybe the economic freedom narrative of Black America? Sure, I'm on uh, the board of a few corporations. I'm in a position as a result of that to guide their policies in terms of how they interact with Black businesses. I'm in a position to advocate for Black professionals and to ensure that they're treated with respect. Um, I'm, I'm in a position to interact with other Blacks that are on corporate boards and we trade notes about how uh, corporate America can, can have a different kind of relationship with Black people. And so, you know, I think after the civil rights movement, we put so much emphasis on politics that we fail to recognize that the political table is not the only table that has seats. Mm. And so when we talk about having a seat at the table, we generally are referring to the political table. But I, I have more influence in certain spaces as one black man on the board of certain corporations as many black politicians in New Jersey. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's an inside game. 85% of the corporate directors in this country become corporate directors through personal contacts. So it's, it's not like you can, you can respond to a classified ad. <laughs> you know, it's not like uh, they're gonna come to your college and recruit you to be a corporate director. There's a strategy for becoming a corporate director. And since I've been on eight boards that pay me, I know a little something about how to do it. And so I'm taking my 25 years of experience and I put it into a course and uh, I make the course available. And once a month I have a kind of a live coaching session for all of my participants. And I'm teaching them how to identify opportunities and then secure seats in corporate America. Hmm. Fantastic. I'm gonna take that one day. Um, so we do have a, a question from an attendee in the Q&A and they are asking, where does one start when multiple debt has defaulted, filed in civil court, and now standing in garnishment um, for any city or state job? Well, you know what? Uh, this anonymous attendee has already started. Just asking the question is the beginning. Listening in on this conversation is the beginning. When, when, I, when I got started, you know what the first thing I did? The first thing I did was I started listening to radio programs about money. You know, I was a big radio guy and I loved, you know, um, urban radio, WBLS. I love, you know, FM, R&B. Well, I, if, I learned that if I go from FM, R&B to AM talk, <laughs> I could learn so much about money. And so I was, I was commuting between Jersey and New York for work. I was listening about, to about an hour a day about money and it changed my life. So the first step is this, participating, listening, to this kind of conversation because if you get one good idea that you didn't have before, it can be life-changing. And then the second is to use a guide. I mean, I, I have um, in my book, I tell my story. And if it's not me, it's somebody else. I've always learned you know, that if you can find someone who is what you wanna be or who has done what you wanna do and they're willing to give you their strategy, that's gold. Now I give away my strategy in a book form because I don't feel like traveling all over the country talking to one person at a time. Um, friend of mine in Jamaica has a, has a uh, slogan. It says, uh, an ounce of ink make a million think. Mm. And I never forgot that. Uh, he told me that in the, in the early eighties. And so what I do is write books, but there are plenty of books and there are plenty of people. Um, John Hope Bryant has Operation Hope. He's a great resource. You can find him on YouTube. You can read his books. Um, think uh, it's uh, some, oh God. There's a book about 
uh, Wealth Being a Black Choice. Oh, The um, Black Choice by uh, Walter Kimball, I think. Dennis, oh, is it Dennis Kimbrough? Dennis, Den Dennis yep. Kimbrough. Yep. Dennis Kimbrough. So, so all I'm saying is, so that, and, and then you got to get started. You have to write down all of your challenges. You have to develop a strategy. If you're drowning in debt, you know, I, I agree with Dave Ramsey on this. You pay off your smallest debt first, and then you're next to your smallest, and you work your way up to your largest. Uh, you go online. You can take my course for free and get all the ideas you can. Get all the free stuff you can first. <laughs> There's a lot of free stuff out there. And ask for help when you need it. And so uh, another question um, that I have is, is, as someone who works in, um, in higher education, if there's, if I'm, if I'm recruiting students to come to the university that I work at and they're like, I'm not doing student loans. How, do, what, what do you say to like these incoming, this incoming generation of college students with regard to their student loans and student loan debt? Well, we encourage people Langston, first of all, to work, get a job. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with having a job, work. That's number one. Number two, go part-time. You know, uh, only 20% of the college students in America graduate in four years, only 20%. That means that most of us like me that go to school full-time, we're not gonna graduate in four years anyway. So why don't you stretch it out to six years even and go part-time in the fall and the summer and work and pay as you go. There are plenty of options to taking out big student loans. Go to a junior college for two years and, and then go to a four-year college. Junior college is, is much cheaper than a four-year college. Apply for scholarships. We have a young lady called the college girl that grew up at First Baptist. You may mm -hmm. remember her, uh, Jessica Brown. She was around, she's around your age. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica wrote a book on think, how to pay for college if you're broke. And Jessica talks about that hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship money that no one ever applies for. Do your research. I met a woman in Chicago a few years ago. She, she had uh, three children and all of them went all through college with scholarships because she made it her full-time job, find the scholarships. So working, going part-time, community college and scholarships, that, that's a good place to start. That's good. And what do you say to the person who's recently graduated, um, who is maybe, listen, I'm going to tell you what I think. I don't think the government's going to bail everybody, everybody's student loans out. I, I just, I don't, I don't see it happening. And so what's, what's the wake up call for people who are waiting for the Biden administration or whatever administration that's coming next to, to make them realize that you just need to pay your loans off. Yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. You can see what's happening in Washington now. Um, you've got Democrats that don't even support the Democratic president's initiatives on things that would help their own constituents. And so, no, the, 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 way, you, the way you deal with your student loan debt is you pay it off as quickly as you can. In other words, every penny that you don't have to spend on something, you don't need car washes. You can wash your own car. You don't need Starbucks. Listen, I went from Starbucks to uh, Dunkin' Donuts thinking I was being like heroic, right? Mm -hmm. From $5 to $2. I've stopped going to Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. I make my own tea. I buy 24 tea bags for, for just 5 or $6. I make my own tea. I'm saving big money not going to Dunkin' Donuts. But I'm, and I have money. And what I've learned is that the more money I get, the less money I spend. <laughs> I, the, the more money I have, the more money I feel I'm keeping. Yeah. So what, what you want to do, if you just graduated from college, you want to give yourself a deadline for when those student loans have been paid off. Another problem, Max, that we have for those in school is that often we take out more money than we need. We borrow mm -hmm. more yeah. money than we need. So we borrow some to pay tuition and some for lifestyle. That's right. And it's so it's, so many people do it, we feel that it's normal. 
But what you want to do is pay as much as you can, as often as you can on your student loan and give yourself a deadline to pay it off because the student loan will never ever go away until you pay it off. If you die, I've got people right now, I've got letters, email I could show you where people have inherited the loans from their parents. Yeah, that's not good. It's not good. And I would say this, as someone who went to an HBCU, don't use your refund check to get right for homecoming. It's not worth it. It's not worth it in the long run. Just just get you a job at a clothing store and, and get you get your clothes right. But don't 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 if you don't need the money, make make sure you don't take it. Um so we're at about 15 minutes left and we're going to transition to uh, me talking about our next episode, but I do want to ask one last question. So uh, be- before, before our conversation with you, the last talk I had was with a brother by the name of Isaiah Jackson, and he wrote a book called Bitcoin in Black America. Yeah. And so I, I think I saw you had some event recently or an event coming up talking about cryptocurrencies and things like that. W- what are your thoughts on this new money that's coming coming around? Yeah, I've started the conversation. I have uh, a short conversation with a fintech executive whose company is about to make cryptocurrency available to their members, uh, their customers. Well, uh, first of all, I think cryptocurrency is here to stay. That's number one. Too many central banks around the world are adopting it. Uh, too many corporate investments are going into it. Cryptocurrency is, you know, I, I told some guys the other day, so you know, when, when, when rap music first started, we thought it was just a fad. Mm. <laughs> All the old heads, you know, especially those of us that were involved in music, oh, that's just a fad, it'll go away. And now hip hop rules the world. Hip hop drives the culture. Uh, I think cryptocurrency is the financial version of hip hop. Wow. And I think cryptocurrency is here to stay. I think uh, it's very volatile, it's very risky. Right now, there's a big lawsuit between the Securities and Exchange Commission and Ripple because their cryptocurrency is, is, well, SEC says that it's a security and not a commodity. And so they're fighting, uh, but the resolution of that's gonna be critical because Ripple has a cryptocurrency that has a, uh, a use case, mm. you know, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, many other coins that, you know, they're just, they're, 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 they are volatile because they're sketchy and we're not sure where it's going to go, but, but there, there are some cryptocurrencies that have a use case and what you want to do is look for the cryptocurrencies that have some functional purpose within some enterprise. And that's the cryptocurrency that's most likely to last. But uh, only about 3% of us have enough money to invest in crypto because right now, the only money that you can invest in crypto is money that you can afford to lose. Yeah. And most of us can't afford to lose $5. That's right. So w- what I'm hearing you say is, is that if you have five thousand dollars worth of credit card debt at six sixteen point nine percent before you get that bitcoin you might want to pay off that credit card that's it or car loan debt or furniture debt or rent to own debt or payday loan debt you know there's a whole lot of debt in fact if you have a payday loan you need to pay that off right away yeah. because you're, you're headed for financial hell that's right the payday loan is the crack cocaine of the financial services industry it's the devil's bank that's That's what i think and here in san antonio where i live we have the highest concentration of payday loans payday loan places in the country right so right yeah and before we go i want to just give an example of a token that has a usage pastor stories for for people that don't know so uh my wife and i recently got what's called a helium hotspot And basically what they're trying to do is we bought a cell phone tower that's in our house and it's the size of like a a, a Wi-Fi modem. And essentially what this company is trying to do is get people to put them in their houses and create an alternative cell phone network 
as opposed to AT&T owning all the towers. And so what happens is as, as our helium hotspot gets used, we get a helium token or a percentage of a helium. Yeah, token. yeah, yeah. And so yeah. after about a year, the box that we bought will pay for itself and the rest of it will be income. So when we talk about tokens, cryptocurrencies that have a usage, That's it what means I mean. that it's attached to something that is right. actually providing a service and has a function in the society. That's exactly exactly what I'm talking about. Although I don't have a helium hotspot. Should I have one? You should think about it. Are you the, using it now for are you using it for this connection? Mm -mm, mm -mm, no. So or it's not it for talking. It's not a Wi-Fi router. It think of it like a cell phone tower. Yeah. And honestly, I don't even know if my cell phone picks up on it. I just know that it provides the service like outside of my house. I see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so like I'm the only one in my neighborhood, so I don't make that much money off of it. But if my neighbor down the street had one, my box would talk to their box. And if wow. someone on the next street had one, all three boxes would talk. And so as the network grows and the boxes are spaced out at a good distance, you create the network and there's more sort of triangulation among the boxes that provide the service for the wow. wireless usage. Well, you see, you just answered your previous question. How do we impact the culture? We impact the culture by having stories, testimonies that we can share with each other and they go viral. Unfortunately, now the culture has become so polluted that uh, debauchery and decadence goes viral uh, mm -hmm. first. But, you know, people, at some point, people get too tired or too old to just watch Megan Thee Stallion all day long. Yeah. And they're going to want to figure out how they can get paid instead of, uh, instead of her benefiting from them watching her. And, and, and that's, and I think, I think, I think there are a lot of young people like yourself out there looking for concrete solutions to persistent problems. And they're not willing to sit back and just accept the status quo. So yeah. I commend you and, 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 and your network and just let me know how we can hook up and when we can do things together and, and I'm yours. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time, Pastor Sories. Yeah. Um, if you could do one thing before you go, if you can type in the chat, the website for D free and maybe how people can follow you on social media and whatnot. And those of you who are still here, y'all give me one second. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk about what the next um, meeting for entrepreneurial appetite will be. Well, my social media handle is right there. That's right. At DB stories. Right. And my website is right there. Uh, well, I, you know what? I got to put it to everyone. My website is uh, dbsori.com. If you, you, you go to my website and everything I do is, is accessible through my website. All of my books, all of my connections, my director's course, all of that is accessible. You go to dbsori.com and you can contact me. You just, there's, there's a tab that says connect. And when you click that tab, you can send me a message. So there you go. Y'all got it. Get connected. If you want strategies for getting out of debt, the materials are online at the DFree website for free. Um, get it, get involved with uh, a ministry that promotes the DFree movement. I had a great community when I went through the program because oftentimes we don't always have people who are supportive of us trying to do better. But one of the things that I loved about the DFree program was that it provided me with a coach and some classmates, some teammates who helped me along the process. Right. And so for those of you who are still here, I'm going to talk about next month on July 29th at 7 p.m. Central, 8 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to have a conversation with a good friend of mine, colleague named Dr. Joseph Cooper, who recently published a book called Black Males Holistic Underdevelopment Through Sport and Miseducation. And we're partnering with the Social Justice Olympic Summit, which is a, a first time community curated series of events based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And like always, we will be having our discussion online, but we like to partner with Black nonprofits and other Black businesses to sort of host these conversations about Black liberation, uh, Black economy and intellectualism in a multiple context. So 
I encourage you all to join that conversation. And then also, if you want to register for that, you can do so here using this QR code. Also, Pastor Stories, while you're here, I do want to say that um, the people who were able to participate today, they did make a donation to support my platform. And so 10% of what I got to do this tonight, I'm going to make the donation to the uh, D-Free movement. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing moving forward. Uh, the businesses and the entities that we partner with, the nonprofits, whatever you all use to pay to get access to the live conversations, we'll be using those to support. Um, like, sir, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Every word you say is being typed on yeah. the screen. How does that happen? So, so what I'm doing is, so when you have a PowerPoint set up, when you have PowerPoint go, go live on the, on the big screen, what it does is it has the um, accessibility function where it hears you and it provides the captions. I've been doing I've been doing these webinars for two years and, yeah. and no one ever told me that before. Yeah. So anytime you have, anytime at least for me, anytime that I have the PowerPoint opened up, it just automatically does that. So if we were if we had like a PowerPoint up the whole time where, while you and I were having a discussion, it would track the captions. So that when you want to go back and present the recording on YouTube for people who, of course, obviously are hearing impaired, they can they can read. Amazing! You're going to get somebody fired. Not <laughs> it should be it should be pretty stock though. Like I'm I'm not touching any buttons to make it happen. It just does it automatically for me. All right, all right, everybody. Thank y'all for coming. Um, and Pastor Sirs, I'm glad I could make you aware of that if there's like anything else like that that you I can help you out with um just let me know we're gonna stop recording and if anybody has any other comments or anything like that